is going on, go get us. In this week's episode, we talked to Ryan Babyface Benoit. Ryan Benoit is an interesting cat to say the least. Ryan is a former flyweight in the UFC and now competes in bare knuckle boxing. Yeah, guys, this conversation was so much fun. This is honestly one of my favorite podcasts to film to date. Who knows? Maybe we'll head back down to Dallas pretty soon, film a part two. We'd love to know what you guys think about this podcast. This whole Dallas trip has been unbelievable for us so far. So like, subscribe, share with a friend. We love you. Peace. (laughs) Go get his podcast. Ryan Benoit. We're here live in Octagon MMA. Thank you guys again for the hospitality. This is amazing. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're welcome. It's good Yo, to have you guys. I appreciate you for doing this, man. I must admit, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I'm too, man. I see all you guys' equipment, and I, like the setup looks good. You guys got me nervous now. <sighs> Thank you, man. Well, this is, I mean, we're used to this. This is not really too much, but being uh, around somebody like yourself and, like, in the realm in which we operate, like, is pretty, like, crazy, I must say. So, like, Thank he you, is man. right. Like, I try to not get too nervous before pods or like to let it like overcome me or anything but he is kind of right this is a pretty surreal moment i must say thank you guys thank you you're making me feel great about Mm. myself (laughs) it's awesome what you do bro thank you it really is yo how did you get into i know you started wrestling right yeah yeah so uh how did you get into martial arts so i uh let me see let me let me go way back so i started wrestling when i was young i was 10 years old Mm -hmm. um basically we used to have like the screens at my middle school and they said that they had tryouts for wrestling. Right. Mm-hmm. And yeah. My dad had, my dad had, um, talked about how he was a wrestler as a kid and, uh, we used to kind of like wrestle around with him and stuff. Anyways, I didn't have much going on. I had just played baseball like my yeah. whole life and I didn't have any sports going on. And, um, so I was like, yeah, fuck it. Oh, I don't know if I can. That's okay. No, nah, that's nah, okay, yeah, bro. Go for it. Be yeah. you. Okay. Express yourself fully. All right, cool. So me as a 10 year old, I was like, fuck it. I'm going to go out <laughs> <Yeah>. for wrestling. <laughs> So, uh, anyways, I, uh, I ended up just like going right after school. I didn't, I did at that time, you know, cell phones and, and communication wasn't as easy as yeah. it is today. Mm-hmm. So I remember, I remember having to call my mom from like the school's pay phone and I <laughs> called, I called her with like, um, like a, I, I can't even remember what they were. They were like AT and T, like something collect or one yeah. collect or some shit. And I was like, "Mom, I said after wrestling." And I, like, I tried to squeeze <laughs> in the message real quick, and then I, I hung up the phone, and she didn't understand anything. And then I remember it was like, uh, like getting home, and it was like six o'clock, and uh, I got on like the sports bus to take us home, and they like missed my house and stuff. <laughs> and I was like talking, and my mom was like, "I had no idea where you were at." I was yeah. about to like call the police and be like, "Where's he at?" And so, anyways, that's kind of where I started. And um, I really liked wrestling, and I, I just stayed at it, and I wrestled all through middle school, through high school. I wrestled mm. my freshman year in college. And, um, but when I was in high school, I started to, like, get really interested in boxing. And, like, I had always wanted to do boxing as a kid. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My parents were definitely against it. Um, you know, they, they loved that I was wrestling, but, you know, I wanted to play football and play other, yeah. like, rough sports. But I was a little guy. You know, mm-hmm. when I was a freshman in high school, I, I was, like, I was like 80 pounds soaking yeah. wet when I was a, when I was little, you know? So like the lowest weight class in, in high school was 103. So I was like, damn, yeah, I was tiny. Right. And, um, so in, in high school, I used to like hit the bag and I would used to use a lot of boxing to cut weight for wrestling. Right? Yeah. Mm. And, and Manny Pacquiao was like getting a lot of, a lot of spark at the time. I was a big fan of Pacquiao. Oscar de la Hoya was, was still fighting at the time. Um, Floyd Mayweather and all those fights, and I was I was a big fan of uh, Oscar, and I was a big fan of uh, uh, Manny Pacquiao. Mm. I used to watch their countdowns and stuff, and so I would try to like hit like them. I would try to watch how they threw their uppercuts. I would try to watch how they threw their jabs and stuff. And so I kind of just like, you know, at 16, started kind of like training myself. Mm. And then eventually in the summer, I started working with this boxing coach, and mm-hmm. it was just kind of like private lessons out of his garage. Mm-hmm. And then um, I started doing like some submission grappling also, which was like at LA Fitness with another guy who was like a like a black belt in jujitsu, right? Yeah. And this is this is a long time ago. This yeah. is like 2005, 2006, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And um, I remember watching the UFC on TV and seeing Matt Hughes fight Carlos Newton. That was probably like the first first actual MMA fight I saw, and it stuck out of my mind because I saw Matt Hughes, and he looked like such a wrestler. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was like, this guy obviously wrestles. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think it was a fight where he puts Carlos up against the cage, and then he like slams him down on the ground mm-hmm. and knocks him out cold with a triangle. Damn. So Carlos had him up. Carlos had him in a triangle choke, and Matt puts him up against the fence, yeah. and he's oh. got him up like this, and mm-hmm. he backs up, and he drops him. Yeah. And he drops him because the triangle choke was mm-hmm. starting to put him out, but mm-hmm. he ends up knocking out Carlos Newton at the same time. Oh, okay. And, uh, man, I went nuts. So, anyways, yeah. I remember when I was 16, my my 
high school uh, uh, history teacher. His name was uh, Mr. Cornelius. He asked me what I wanted to do when I got older. <laughs> Cornelius. <laughs> Cornelius. He was awesome. What he, did you uh, tell him? I told him I wanted to be a UFC fighter. Oh, and he man. was, man, he just was like, ah, oh, the octagon. Yeah. It, just, it was so exciting when he told me. It even, like, that moment sticks out in my mind a lot because I was like, I got, like, excited with his yeah. reaction. I was mm. like, oh, snap, this is cool. Look at it. That's awesome. He got excited with me saying mm. that I wanted to be a pro fighter. Mm. And so that definitely, like, kind of, like, helped motivate me to be yeah. like, oh, man, like I said it out loud. Mm-hmm. Like maybe that is mm-hmm. what I actually want to do because wrestling kind of like had nowhere to go if you yeah. didn't make it in the Olympics. Mm-hmm. And I knew I was a good wrestler and I might do well in college, but like I probably wasn't going to be in the Olympics. Yeah. I wasn't like coming, mm-hmm. you know, top top three mm-hmm. in the country or mm-hmm. anything. I was like barely doing well in the state. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so anyways, I did wrestled all through high school when I was uh, a freshman in college in California. I started boxing a lot. And then mm-hmm. when I came back from um from wrestling in California, I I started training at Saxons, and I was only 18 when I started training yeah. at Saxons, and he kind of, he took an interest in me and took me under his wing, and I think it was mostly because he saw what a good wrestler I was, and mm-hmm. I could take down, like, everybody in the gym at the time, mm-hmm. the guys that are, like, way bigger than me, because um, most of them had never wrestled before, and I was, you know, I was, I was like, a, 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 you know, I was a pretty high-level wrestler at the mm-hmm. time, and uh, it was great. He took a big interest in me, taught me how to fight, taught me how to kickbox, and then, from there, it just kind of spawned out, and yeah, you know, I've been uh, been training for a long for time, for a very now. long time. It's awesome you say that about the teacher thing, though, because where we come from, like he and I both uh, played a lot of football when we were younger. Pretty much our entire lives, we were invested in football, and I know at least for me, probably it was like a really wild thing to say, but like it was the opposite, and I wanted to play football. So every time uh, I was asked that question, I'd be like the NFL. But like where we are from, people would tell you you are insane for saying that. So that's like that must have been pretty uh revolutionary in your life to be able to like say that out loud speaking into existence and then like people actually supported believed in you yeah if that makes sense yeah yeah for sure you know it was it was uh i look back on it now because i listen to so much motivational stuff yeah. and i listen to inspirational stuff mm-hmm. and like you know i hear i hear i heard one the other day that was like if you believe in a dream or if you believe in something write it down because yeah. you can say it's written right there mm-hmm. so like, when people people used to have this saying that was like well where's that written it's like it was written right here I yeah wrote it, you know and so like when 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 he told me that it was like a big it was it lit yeah. a fire in me it lit it lit an inspiration and like you know it was a, it was a cool feeling i grew up as like a shy kid in high school i yeah. wasn't i wasn't like a big class clown or anything i was pretty quiet um i moved to texas when i was 14 from virginia which i i mostly grew up in virginia yeah. i lived there since i was five and then we moved to texas when i was in high school and it was like i went from like a a small town in yeah. virginia to like mm. uh, mckinney texas which was like a 4a high school and like I went from going to school where everybody had like um, like off-roading trucks and had shotguns in their trucks. Yeah. It was mostly rednecks in Virginia. And then when I moved to Texas, it was like the new Mustang had come out. Mm, and I remember yeah. seeing the Mustangs like lined up in the parking lot. <laughs> I was like, holy shit. Like, yeah. it was like we had an indoor football field. Mm. Like, a, It was like, you know, and that's common in Texas. They yeah. love like, football in Texas. Right? Yes, sir. They they even, love football. I'd never even seen a turf field before. And yeah. the baseball field was a turf yeah. field. I was like, what the fuck is going on here? And... Uh, um, it was just, it was a big change up for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, so wrestling was like a big like escape for me. You know, yeah. I, I, d- I did well in wrestling when I moved to Texas. Like I did, I did really well, like right away. But it was kind of like I had, I had, I didn't really have friends. It was yeah. just my brother and I and like the wrestling team. And like most of the guys on the wrestling team were brand new at the time because the program was yeah. only like a year old. Yeah. McKinney North was like a, it was like a brand new high school at the time. So most of the guys on the team didn't have much experience. Mm. But I had been wrestling for like five years or four years already when I moved here. So yeah. I did. I did well right away, and it was like, <clears throat> now that I see how it, how it went along, you know, I didn't have any distractions, and like when I, I tell people all the time, when I went to high school, like I went to high school for wrestling. Yeah. I didn't go to, I didn't party in high school, I didn't, mm. I didn't go out much, I did like right w- after I graduated, I yeah. hit my little party zone in my shithead phase, mm-hmm. but like, I went to school to wrestle, I didn't, I didn't, I barely graduated with like a 2.1 yeah. GPA probably, and like, you know, that's all I cared about, I was a good kid and stuff, but all I cared about was wrestling. That's great, man, that you found or like at what, I guess, age would you say you like knew that that was like your path? I guess like in a way, like in your head, you just knew that like this is what I'm going to be doing forever. Like, did you like achieve that at that point in your life in school or obviously like you were really locked in on doing it? But did you know like, damn, like I really might be doing this forever? Are you talking about you're talking about like um, fighting or are you talking about like um, I guess wrestling jump started it for you, but. I get. I know you were saying before. At a certain point, you realized that wrestling wasn't going to be the path. Was it during wrestling that you realized that you at least wanted to be involved in martial arts? 
um, going forward? You know, it was probably more like after I got, I was finished with wrestling, right? Like mm. after, after I was like, I, I quit going to school. My bad, my phone's going, Not going off or something. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways. Um, so like when I, when I, I think when, when I had realized like I have, there was nothing to do with wrestling, right? And I didn't, at the time I was an immature kid when I, when I, even when I started to get into fighting, like. I, I was just fighting just to be cool, you know. I was mm. fighting because I wanted to tell people that I was a professional fighter. I wanted mm. to, like, I was doing something better than all the people that yeah. I was around were doing. And, like, and it was something I enjoyed and I liked and I was a big fan of. But it wasn't until that, like, like uh, probably, probably when I was, like, 20 years old, right? I had, a, I had a training partner whose name was Edwin Figueroa, right? And he... He ended up fighting in the UFC, but we were training partners for like a long time. Yeah. We start when I started at Saxons, he was at Saxons, and I used to beat the shit out of him like <laughs> wrestling, right? And it was kind of one of those things that like I beat this guy's ass in training all the time, and he's like doing well in fights. So he's just yeah. years ahead of me, right? Mm -hmm. And um, he got in the UFC, and then somehow some rumor got to Sean Shelby, who was the matchmaker. And when he was weighing in at the UFC, Sean Shelby goes up to Saxon, who was my original coach in in Muay Thai. Yeah. Um, he's the one that I was saying earlier taught me how to fight and stuff. So he goes up to Saxon and he's like, you know, I heard you have another guy. He was like, what's the other guy's name? And at the time I had like two fights. Right? Yeah. And he was like, no, he's not ready. And he was like, no, but what's his name? And he was like, his name's Brian. Right. And Saxon can't uh. say his art. He, said, <laughs> but he called me babyface for like, man, like, I don't, like eight years before yeah. he was like, oh, your name's Ryan, right? <laughs> I was like, dude, we fought in the UFC. You've heard my name, yeah. you know, over and over again. People ask you. Anyways, Crazy Thai guy. And um, so he, Sean Shelby asked Saxon about me. He came back. He was all excited. He was like, you know, we got to get you some fights and whatever. So at that point, I was probably like, you know, this is something I could probably do. And yeah. I remember talking to, to my high school wrestling coach who knew me, like, really well. And I had my, my fights with my wrestling coach because I was helping out with my, my old high school wrestling yeah. team at the time. Okay. Right? So I was going back after high school, and I was, like, helping everybody drill, and I was teaching them – talking shit to them and whatever like I was I was bored and I mm -hmm. liked wrestling still and I told him that I was thinking about like being a fighter and I was thinking about like you know I wanted to be in the UFC and he yeah. was like if you're gonna do that Ryan you gotta you gotta go like a hundred percent for yeah. it right mm -hmm. and he was like man I remember he was like real stern and he looked at me and he was in his office and he was like a hundred percent yeah and he was like I'm serious like you can't be focused on anything else you mm -hmm. have to just go for that and you have to just focus on that right and, like, I took that as, like, the green light because, like, he's somebody that I really respected. Yeah. I really looked up to him. I respected everything he told me to do. He was, like, one of my teachers, and he was my wrestling coach. And so I was, like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Mm. And so I really started training, you know, a lot more. And in my head, it was, like, a lot more serious. And it was, like, becoming a part of me of, like, this is what I do now. And so I was probably about, I was probably about 20 years old. And then um, I had a year in 2013 that I was going to get married. And... Um, my wife had told me, like, if you don't make it in the UFC by the end of this year, that's it. We got to focus on, like, yeah. our family and stuff. Yeah. I was young, too. I was only, I was 23 to 24. And uh, we were about to have our first daughter. So wow. we, got, we got married, and she got pregnant, like, yeah. I don't know, like a month, probably a month later. <laughs> Go figure. Baby and face. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> And uh, so um, she told me, you know, you have, you have till the end of this year to make yeah. it in fighting and if you don't make it we gotta we gotta do other stuff right mm. and so it was i had i had a bunch of fights that year i had i had lost my first fight but it was a great fight i got like fight of the year in canada yeah and and it was a i went up you know i was fighting at an upper a higher weight class and it was a great fight and then i followed it up with some really good knockouts mm. you know one right after the other and then i broke my hand and then the ufc called me like i'm talking like a couple of days after i broke my hand wow they're like can you fight sergio pettis on like a one week notice yeah, that's crazy and i was like no i just broke my hand yeah and um then they called me like a couple of weeks later it was probably like two to three weeks later and mm. they were like you know can you fight uh this other guy on like a uh, six days notice and my manager was like you know i don't know if they're gonna ask again but like mm. you know yeah. how's your hand doing and yeah. i was like fuck it and i just cut my cast yeah. off it was about to come off in like a couple of days anyway so i cut my cast off I got an x-ray, I got cleared by the doctor, and then I flew out to Vegas and I fought in the UFC. <laughs> wow. So first then, fight. First fight, right? Damn. And I had never made weight at 125. I had fought at 130 the fight before that, and um, I was probably weighing about like, probably about like 145, right? Yeah. I probably cut about 20 pounds to get oh down, down to weight. And I made weight. My opponent missed weight. He, he was overweight by a pound and a half. Mm. And at the time, they had some weird rules, like you had to get... 
you get like ten percent of your opponent's fight purse. So yeah. If you guys, if you guys get a a um a bonus, it goes to the guy mm. that made weight, mm -hmm. not to the guy that didn't make. So if you guys, yeah. and this had never happened before, so if you guys fought, one guy made weight, one yeah. guy missed weight, and you guys got fight of the night, the guy that made weight gets both bonuses, so wow. he gets a hundred grand. Wow! So that was the first time that had ever happened, right? So it, is it still like that to this day? Because I know that happened recently with uh. Who was it? Kevin Holland and Kamzat, right? Yeah, yeah. It was he was supposed to he was scheduled to fight Nate Diaz, and I think they yeah. ended up fighting uh, catchweight, right? And I believe Kamzat yeah, yeah, yeah. won fight of the night, but he was over by like nine pounds. So would he still to this day like have to forfeit his whole purse over to like Kevin Holland? Hundred percent. Really? That, that's wow. How, that's that's how the rule works, wow. I, and I think they try to avoid that as much as they can yeah. now, and they try to like scoot it around. But it was when I fought, it was kind of like a, a weaker fight card, right? Yeah. It was like mm -hmm. the Ronda Rousey Misha Tate mm -hmm. finale. Mm -hmm. So like not to not to. It was like a lot of girl fights, right? Yeah. And so they were kind of like slow. There was a lot of decisions. And there was there was only one submission. And the guy submitted me in the second round. It was a banger of a fight. I broke my hand. I tore my shoulder. And I tore my mm. hip. And I think it was the weight cut that my body was kind of falling apart. And um, so anyways, it was a good fight. He submitted me in the second round. Yeah. So for the first, like, up until, like, the last two fights, I was going to get the guy's bonus for submitting me. So it was going to, because at the time it wasn't performance yeah. of the night. It was submission of the night, knockout of the night. Really? Mm. Fight of the night, right? Okay. So this is 2013. We were still fighting on Facebook at the time. Wow. And, and yeah, it was a while. <laughs> and and uh, wow. so he submitted me and the rest of the fights were, were boring decisions, yeah. right? So for like up until the last fight, I was going to get a 50 grand bonus for submission of the night. And I got submitted. Wow. Right? So then Chris Holdsworth ends up submitting his guy. So Chris Holdsworth gets submission of the night. Damn. And we ended up getting fight of the night. Oh, wow. So I got fight of the night. It was, so I took the fight on a six days notice with a broken hand. And I got 100 grand in like a week. That's gnarly. That changes your life, though. Oh, completely, man. Completely. That was like. Damn. It took, I took, I t after that fight, I took a couple of months off because my body was falling yeah. apart. And then I, was, I came back and I was supposed to fight Ray Borg in my next fight. Yep. Yeah. And then I tore my bicep. Like a, a couple of days before the fight, so after that fight, I didn't fight for another sixteen mm. months, and then oh, I shit. fought, and then I fought Sergio Pettis. That's the big TKO. Yeah, yeah and then I, I I finished Pettis. Yeah, but he he fractured my, he shattered my orbital my my orbital not my orbital my zygomatic cheekbone, yeah. which is the bone that runs over the top of your jaw, right? Yeah. So he hit me with an elbow in the okay. first round. He shattered my cheekbone, my orbital, and broke my nose, right? I can imagine that doesn't feel good. Uh, I felt like <laughs> shit, right? I, I could barely get my mouthpiece out. Like I, could, I had oh, to like wiggle man. it out because my, my broken bones in my cheek were hitting the jaw bones. Yeah. Oh, they were crashing shit. into each other. Fuck. So like, I was just like, what the fuck? And like, yeah. as I tried to take my mouthpiece out, I couldn't really like open my mouth. I got it out and like rinsed it out. And like yeah. I remember starting in the second round, like, damn, he mm -hmm. hit me with everything that round, like... There's nothing. He's not going to hurt me anymore. Yeah. And like, I had it in my mind that he couldn't hurt me, like, yeah. at all. So I just kept kind of running through everything. I got him with the left hook, and then I put him away. When do you come to terms with that, like, damage? Or do you ever, like, as a fighter, come to terms with, like, what is actually physically taking place and happening to your body? Like, do you ever come to terms with that? <laughs> Man, that's a good that's a good question, you know, because guys take a lot of damage. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you probably saw, like, Max Holloway takes, like, yeah. yeah. And he puts out a ton of damage. But you'll see mm. guys, like, getting in wars. And not... Not acting like nothing, nothing's affected. Yeah, you know yeah. I mean, they're just taking it and going forward, mm. taking it and going forward, you know? And, like, you can you can feel your face lumping up. You can feel yeah. things are starting to not look good. And, you can, yeah. and, like, you start getting self-conscious of, like, oh, fuck, and my face is starting to get, like, yeah. touched up now, right? And, like, for me, it's, like, I, I get, like, tunnel vision, right? I don't, it doesn't bother me. Mm. Like, if I start, my eye starts to close or if I feel, like, cuts, like, I just, I'm aware of it, but, like, it doesn't. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not worried about like getting my my face damaged at all, right? Because yeah. I'm like, it's already damaged. Mm -hmm. Like, just go ahead and, and like, as long as I'm getting in there, and mm -hmm. as long as I'm getting my own, like, yeah. I'm I'm not thinking at all about what the guy just did to me. That's insane because those type of wars are, in, like, so exciting to watch. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that you attribute the the classic, uh, the tough wrestler mindset to being able to go into those wars and still persevere like that? Yeah, that's that's probably a big part of it, you know. Yeah. Is that, you know, um, um, wrestlers, man, wrestlers are different. You They're know, tough motherfuckers, bro. It really, yeah. it, it's 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 another level, you know. They they uh, they have blood time, you know. You guys, I mean, if you in freestyle and Greco wrestling, they make you start the match with like a rag, right? You have to yep. show the referee your rag, mm. and stick it in your pants, because they're not gonna stop the time. If you start bleeding, you gotta wipe it and then keep mm. on, you know. And yeah. Or if they have like blood time, it's a, that's just a weird rule that like we have. 
a blood time. We, yeah. we have blood time out yeah. for our sport. You know, you can do that in high school too. It's in high school, yep. right? That's it's yeah. a it's a it's a tough sport, you know. And and um, I think it's it kind of goes back to like wrestling practices are like the hardest thing ever. Like they are when even even like fighting professionally and like some of the I've trained like all over the world and I've trained with like some of the best guys on the planet. Yeah, like wrestling practice is the hardest. The mm. hardest sport there is. Some of the kids I knew in high school that did wrestling, like it looked like such a grueling experience having to go through that, like the high school life, while also like having a, a wrestling meet that night that you had to make a certain amount of weight for, where you're wearing like sweatsuits in school, you're not eating garbage no bags, lunch. And shit. yeah, like and you're yeah. going to class and you could tell like you're miserable. Like I, I was friends with a lot of wrestlers in school, and that like life just seems so grueling. Man, the mental the mental build and the mental strength behind wrestlers, it's like, it's it's. It's a it's a crazy like the whole setup is 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 crazy you know because yeah. like it's it's all life lessons yeah you know I don't, I don't know what the percentage is of like athletes that play football that make it in football yeah or but I could say this that the athletes that do wrestling and make it in wrestling yeah. seems like it would be significantly smaller because there's less of a professional route like I believe in the NFL it's like one person it might be less than one percent but at least there's like a professional route you could take that's like what I was interested in asking you is like with MMA like what is the route like or even like with wrestling more specifically like is your goal to just make it to the Olympics at, that's what I mean. Yeah. It, it's kind of like gymnastics. And yeah. it's, you know what I mean? Like all the, there's a lot of sports that are like that, like yeah. track and field or, and, and mm. other stuff that requires so much discipline and so yeah. much training. And, you know, wrestling and MMA is, is very similar. Um, and it's, it's, it's just all life lessons. That's why I was saying like, it's, it's a, it's a crazy setup. Like I remember in high school, like, like just being completely starved. I remember sleeping in trash bags and yeah. like having to take a test on Friday. And mm -hmm. like, I was, I didn't care about the test. I cared about making weight. Yeah. And like I, I slept in a trash bag and then I woke up early so I could check my weight and then I could go get a little bit of weight off and yeah. then I could go throughout my day in school. I check out of school like Damn. a little bit early, cut some more weight, go weigh in mm -hmm. for the duel. And then I would go wrestle, you know? And like, that's that I had it. I didn't, I yeah. skipped the rest of the day of like paying attention mm -hmm. and, yeah. and go and like, focusing on a yeah. test you know and like other kids are are focused on on school yeah you know mm -hmm. i mean they're focused on like academics and like that's mm -hmm. what's important and that's what's bizarre with wrestling it's like no no what's your weight yeah, yeah. nobody's asking like how the test goes like how much did you weigh mm -hmm. did you make weight today like how do you feel yeah you know and like it's a it's a bizarre setup because it, it kind of goes nowhere in a sense mm -hmm. right because we're building so much so much of a, a strong athlete here but what's this person going to do with this? Like, what's, where's this going to go? Yeah. Because he's not doing, he's not doing well in school. And like, it's the same with, with gymnastics in a sense. My daughter does gymnastics and I'm really? kind of like realizing this, like my wife and I were talking about this, like just almost the same subject like a week ago. Yeah. Cause I'm like, you know, let's, let's take her out of gymnastics. She does gymnastics for three hours, four days a week. Right. And so she's training like crazy mm -hmm. and she's great at gymnastics yeah. and, but she's falling behind in school. And mm -hmm. so I was like, She's nine, you know, like, yeah. what do we, take her out of gymnastics for a couple yeah. of days. Like, I don't care if she starts falling behind in gymnastics, but yeah. then the, the gym is kind of like, well, she's going to fall behind. Yeah. Like, she's going to fall, like, the other girls are going to continue. Yeah. Like, well, she's, yeah. she's falling behind at school. Like, yeah. and they're like, okay, I understand mm. if it's, if it's school related, but then it's kind of like, it goes back to like what I was saying. Are we, are we thinking about like, how's the day going? Yeah. Are we thinking about how mentally exhausted this person is mm. uh, doing all this and, and how important is the sport going to be to their yeah. future you know? yeah that must have be hard to compute like as a father because like in one sense like you are a father and you have to make sure that like you're doing what's best for your child but at the same time like you're somebody who's so heavily invested in athletics and like for what it did to your life and how it changed your life like that must be a very hard balance like because if, if you let one uh side slide back the other one's gonna flourish but it's very hard to achieve both a absolutely man it's it's hard to uh it's, I feel like it's hard on, on I, put, I feel like I make it harder on my kids than yeah. I do. Like, cause I, I look at them with the mental strength that I have. I'm like, yeah. well, let's just, let's just focus, you know, yeah. I mean? let's wake up, let's start reading a little bit more before school mm. or let, let's start having our conversations less about our sport or what, what fun she had today. Let's talk about a class yeah. and stuff, you know? And it's like, I, maybe I'm building too much mental pressure on mm. her now. And we were talking about this. I was like, how about we start taking a couple of days and just let her be a kid? Yeah. Just let her get bored in her room. Let her play outside. Let mm. her go to the park. Just let her be a kid, because like it's 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 important for them to be kids. Yeah. As, as as important as everything else is, it's it's important for their minds to mm. uh, to explore and relax too. But you're right, man. It was 
it's a tough it's a tough balance between yeah. because I'm I'm her hardest critic. You know, and my standards mm. are very high mm-hmm. for like what hard work is yeah. and what 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 is appropriate. You know, and like when I, I I eased off on working out with her, like, but I worked out with her during during um during COVID when yeah. we were all in the lockdown, and so because she couldn't go to gymnastics, yeah. and, and it was like I demanded perfection in everything. Mm. Like, nope, let's do that again. Nope, yeah. let's do that again. I don't care if we do it. You know, and I remember her doing you know handstands on her beam like like 60 times in a row until yeah. I saw wow. her, her toes like where they're supposed to be. And mm. even, even after practice, I've seen her like, I'd seen her go to practice and put zero effort in practice, like just yeah. no effort. And when we got home, I was like, okay, let's do this again. Yeah. We're going to do this until we get it right. You know? And, uh, you're right. As like a, as an athlete and as a, as a coach, I'm like, my standards are so you do yeah. this, do it one time and don't have to do it again. Mm. You know? And, uh, sometimes I'm a little bit too hard. It must be crazy uh, being raised by like a professional fighter. Like that, that, that <laughs> gotta be a that gotta be a wild reality to to live in. Because both of my parents, like for the most part, were just workers. So like all the things that I had to instill, like I mean, I took a lot of knowledge from my parents. Don't get me wrong, in terms of work ethic and like what it means to like really put the time in. But in terms of like sports and like business like that didn't revolve around my parents life at all so i pretty much just had to learn that for myself yeah yeah and it's it's uh it's a it's a funny way to to learn how to become an adult like yeah. that on your own because that's kind of where you're you're hitting the phase of like adulthood right and yeah. it's kind of the spot like in school where they kind of skip over of like um yeah. responsibilities and mm. stuff like that mm-hmm. and and things can get kind of like like uh overused in 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 different senses right and um my parents were, were similar too. you know, my dad was in the Navy. My mom was worked her, her whole life, you know, and, uh, my dad was kind of like, you know, in and out cause he was, he was overseas and yeah. he was back and he had a, he was a high ranking military guy. So he was, you know, he was needed where he was needed. And, um, he took care of us and my mom did her best job to be a great mother and take care of us also. And she was a great mom and my dad was, was a great dad also. But like, I, I'll say the same thing. Like that's an aspect of like, I had coaches that inspired me yeah. to be in the sport. My parents were never kind of like, this is what you have to do. This yeah. is what you must do. You know, my, I didn't grow up with my, my parents, you know, as athletes, like my daughter, yeah. my wife, my wife and I met through, through kickboxing. Right. Really? Yeah. So she a bad family, right? No <laughs> kidding, right? And her whole family used to fight. It was, yeah. it was wild. Her mom, her dad, her brother, everybody used to fight. And, um, it's got to be like a, a intimidation thing because I think about this all the time. You ever seen like uh, bad boys when they're they're gonna meet the kid who's coming up to take yeah, his daughter? Yeah, yeah. I think about that all the time. Oh uh, like, yeah, man. Can you imagine trying to date a girl whose parents used to fight? You know, the dad used to be in the UFC. Like that's that's still what he does. He trains you know high end fighters. Yeah. He trains wow. everybody. I mean, I would probably be like, oh fuck that. You know, like. I don't know. You gotta be a fucking savage if you're to date that girl. Right. Yeah. You gotta. No you gotta, other way. There, and, you know, and I try to set like high standards also. Like, this is how you're supposed to treat a woman. You yeah. know, this, mm-hmm. is how, this is what a woman's role is. This is what a man's role is. And, like, this is, uh, this is how a man is supposed to be with his family yeah. and stuff, too. And, um, so they're little, man. I'm probably, yeah. I'm probably putting overdue in a lot of areas, you know, but, yeah. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you can't. Maybe you can. And, uh, I think it's gonna be a funny route for, Oh yeah, man. Us in the future. I mean, I'm sure you, you you think about it a lot. Like, I'm only 21. I have no kids and no plans of having kids anytime soon. So, like, I, <laughs> I couldn't even imagine what to expect. But I just imagine, like, as like what your lifestyle and like probably what, I mean, what revolves around your family's household, like fighting and all that kind of stuff. That must just be a crazy life to grow up. And that's why I brought it up. Yeah, man. I put on. I try to put on like as much fight stuff as possible. Like, yeah. My daughters know who Mike Tyson is and yeah. who Diego Cesar Chavez is, and like. Mm. It's it's funny. They know even like kickboxers, like who yeah. who Sanchai is and who like different different guys. Yeah. And it's a it's cool, you know. I hope it's cool, you know. I hope mm. and like I tried to even think about that. Like I hope my daughters like I don't I don't want to have to worry about them ever. I want them to know that they can beat the shit out of people yeah. if yeah. they need to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but they're super soft. They're mm. very friendly. They they come up here all the time and um they're they're super shy even and uh. I don't know. I think that I think it's good. It reminds me of my wife. That's kind of how she is. Like you yeah. wouldn't, if you guys met her, you wouldn't know that she knows how to fight or that she had you know twenty <laughs> something Muay Thai fights. As That's a insane, bro. Yeah, yeah, and um, gardener in a war. That's she, the, the old phrase. Right? <laughs> yeah, she she's cool, man. She's warrior in a garden. Yeah. Warrior, warrior in a garden. Yeah, yeah. 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 and uh, <laughs> yeah, it's a it's a it's a cool setup. You know, I. Uh, Hopefully we're hopefully we're doing it right. Yeah. Doesn't your daughter do taekwondo? She does. She does muay thai with me. She did jujitsu for a couple of years, and uh, she does she does gymnastics like 
crazy. That's her thing. Yeah, gymnastics is. She did a, she did a few other sports before we. She yeah. found gymnastics, but she kind of excelled in that and took off. And she was, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to mm. focus on this. So, it's a that's a tough sport too, man. Hell yeah, I, gymnastics. I, I, the yeah. strength oh, required yeah. to do gymnastics is surreal. These mm-hmm. girls will be crying like yeah. their eyes out and yeah. they're going. And the coaches don't care. Like yeah. I don't. They're ignoring the tears. If you're gonna cry, go sit with your mom. Yeah. Yep. No, gymnastics is wild. I've known multiple people in high school that like would come to school with swollen ankles. Actually, I knew a girl in high school who was the only person I've ever seen do that thing where they were able to like. Hang on the bar. The iron cross? Like, yeah, the thing. Or I don't know if that's what it was, but the thing where you have to like hang on the bar for like two minutes, you win a hundred dollars or whatever they Oh, like, yeah, the dead yeah. hangs. Yeah, the yeah. I think you were competing against her actually, funnily enough. Lauren but, Morris? Yeah. <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, no, we were in the cafeteria. She did gymnastics. It was like the only person I've ever seen that was able to like d- complete that. Like where they were yep. able to hold on that bar for longer than however X amount of time that you have to do it for. But in turn, like to the reverse of that, like how does like having a wife and kids, like how does that affect like you in the cage, like and mm. for what oh, you do, man. Oh, it's uh, that's funny because like I'll even I'll even like judge uh, fighters like kind of on stuff like that. Yeah, like, do they have a wife? Do they have kids? Do they are they mm. single or like what's yeah. their home life like? Like opponents, you mean? Yeah, like uh, not well. Opponents are like if people ask me like who should I bet on, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. That's kind of like how I'll pick like who I think is win or who's who I think's future is going to be different or not, right? Um. It's kind of like that. If they if they're young, starting trying to start a family, yeah. because like I went through that, right? Yeah. yeah, I know what a distraction your family can be, and yeah. like you like, and I say this all the time. Like people could be parents, but not everybody can be good parents, right? Yeah, and most people like myself that are athletes are going to want to be great parents, and they're going to have high expectations out yeah. of their kids. So it's going to take like a piece of them to put into their kids. And mm-hmm. as the kids start getting older, they take more and more from you, you know? Yeah. And if you want to be a good parent and you want to have a good future for your kids, you got to, you got to be careful, like with how you invest yeah. your time. Right. Right. So I'll say this, it definitely, definitely, like I've told my wife this before that, like, I felt like after we had kids that my, my killer instinct had kind of like gone down. Like really? I, I, that's I, interesting. I have more like sympathy for people. Yeah. Like, oh, I guess that makes sense. Yeah. It, it, it's it, my, cause my conversations like on a, on a daily basis are like different. So it's changing like my, my reactions in my brain and like how I feel about things that yeah. I see now. Really? You know? And it's because I swear it's just because of like the, the family influence yeah. and the female influence. And like, mm. cause it, it used to be like, I could watch like, like I could uh, like as a, as a, before I, my wife moved in m- or my mm-hmm. wife and I got married and we started living together and um, my kids you know I I could be like a bit of like a psychopath in a yeah. sense right watching but like beheadings on Reddit and shit <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> yeah I didn't want to say it but like that's what, exactly what I'm talking about right? <laughs> I could watch like uh, like best gore and like I could just watch you know what I mean it yeah. was like oh this is fucking sick and you know yeah. I'm not like that anymore yeah you know huh. and like I see people that like. Um, I would see just vicious knockouts. Like, yeah, like yeah. Um, I shared one with my friends the other day. I'll share it with you guys <laughs> since you guys follow me. Uh, like felony fights. I saw this one on felony fights that was like, I shared it with a bunch of people I know, and it was like oh, shit. these two guys going at it, and like one guy just gets like, like, <laughs> flatline. Just <laughs> terrible, dude. And like he gets knocked out cold, and he goes down, and the guy, and he's out like snoring already, and the guy just <laughs> oh, haymakers no. him like five or six more oh, times. Oh, no. Gets up and stomps him like, oh, my and it, God. like he's about to kill this guy. Damn. Right? And I remember watching that and just being like, oh, like just thinking yeah. this is amazing. And then now I'm watching and I'm just like, <gasps> oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. He's <laughs> like, Jesus Christ. You yeah. know, and like I have more sympathy for it. And I think that comes from, I don't know if it's maturity. I don't know if it's like, what it is, but I'm going to blame it on me having a wife and kids, right? <laughs> it softens you up a little bit, you think? Yeah. I think so, man. Like, like uh, I used to be able to just be a dog in sparring sessions. Yeah. Like, I'd be like, you know, let's fucking go. Like, I could hear the bell ring, and I yeah. could keep fucking going, whether I was gassed or not. And now I'm kind of like, whew. Yeah. Like, or, or I'm thinking about, like, what my day is going to be like later, mm. or, like, mm. how I'm going to look to my kids, because my kids will see a, my something on my face, and I'm like, oh, shit, yeah. you know. I think that's, like, the idea of the maturity thing that we've been talking about. Like, it takes, like, having to pour yourself into another individual before you really become mature. So, like, when you're focusing all of your time and energy on yourself, like, it's very easy to just be this bad motherfucker who doesn't care if I get hurt, I don't care if I get injured, I don't care if I die, this, that, yep. or whatever. But the moment, like, there's something bigger than you in your life, I guess you can say, is the moment, like... That's like, at least from what I heard, is, like, the moment you mature. is like, where it's not all about you anymore. Like, you have to make sure that, like you're still there to be able to give what you got to give to your people. Yeah. Yep. Well, yeah, I, you, I like that, man. Do you think that that like helps your game or do you think it takes away from your game? Cause in one sense you don't really have the killer instinct anymore, but do you think it makes you more calculative? 
and more understanding that you have to go home to your family at the end of the day? It could be. If, if we're talking about me specifically, I think it takes away, right? Really? I think, I think it took away from, like, uh, a lot of the, like, um, like I, I, man, I used to come out in the first round when I first, my first few fights, yeah. and, like, I was just trying to kill everybody. Like, mm. I'd hit him as hard as I can, going and throwing his mitt. I was all offense, all offense, yeah. all yeah. aggression, you know? And, like, later on in life, it wasn't there as much. Like, I wasn't mm. trying to kill people. I was more, like you said, I was more calculating. I was more using my jab. I was more, like, yeah. kind of watching and, and shit. being careful, you yeah. know? And, like, I started having more decisions. Like, my last three fights in the UFC were all decisions. Mm. And and I got knockdowns, and I had good moments, and I landed good hits. Yeah. And I still had those sparks of, like, like mm. oh, let's go. And, but, like... Like you said, I think it. I think it calculate. It took away from from stuff like that. But there's other people. Like if you look at other greats that had like families, like um, Gilbert Burns is one guy who is really around his family when he fights. Even in training camp and stuff, he keeps his family around. Michael him. Chandler, like the first thing he does after he wins or a fight's over is like his kids rush the. Like that's another thing I wanted to ask you is do like uh do you allow like your wife and kids to come to your fights? I allow my wife. My wife's cornered me actually yeah. in in a few <laughs> fights. Really? <laughs> yeah. That gotta be fucking interesting. Yeah. Man, she she got me to wake up one time and I ended up getting a head kick. And yeah. knocking this guy out. That was an insane head kick. We should put yeah. the clip right here, Kevin. <laughs> Bing. There you go. <laughs> Bro, it made, it made US, uh, what was it? ESPN or something like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, uh, yeah. yep, there you go. It was, uh, it was on, uh, Sports Center. Yeah, yeah. It was like number five on yeah. Sports Center, man. It was, it was, it was cool. <laughs> but I remember, um, I remember like, so I don't know, remember if this was when it happened or not, but I remember circling by and I was doing really well in training camp, like talking to my training partners, right? Because yeah. we were trying out different ideas of like, how can we, how can we, you know, you're always learning. You're always, yeah. you're always yeah. trying out new things. And like, it was doing really well. Like I was mm. really like getting comfortable and opening up and I yeah. was like boxing really well. And so she's like, start talking shit to people, you know, <laughs> keep, keep going, you know, because like I'd hit somebody and I'd be like, yeah. oh, bro, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> get in their head, right? Yeah, I get in their head a little bit, and I start, and I had, I start, other things start coming into effect, right? Like I had this guy, Ricky Lundell, told me, eighty percent of right hands get countered with the left hook, right? So it was like eight times out of ten, he's gonna counter me. And then I had his other guy who worked with him, who was Angelo Reyes, and he was like, every time you sting somebody, yeah. they're gonna come back with some heat, right? Yeah. If you land a clean shot on somebody, their next response is gonna be heat, yeah. right? So then I took that, and I was like, what Ricky said, 80% of right. So eight times out of 10 that I throw the right hand, he's gonna throw the hook. Mm. So then I can be prepared to like dip underneath the yeah. hook, right? So I, I figured that out. Like I was like, let's go. Oh, you like that? <laughs> I, got, I whoop, got a clean one in yeah. and then I'm like, here it comes, here it comes. I know he's coming. I mm. know he's pissed now. I just got in his fucking head and yeah. now boom, I go right hand, I roll underneath it. And now I get them to like, I kind of like uh, uh, bullfighter them and I'm like, okay, like everything's kind of like cruising along now. And it was working really well, like in training camp. Yeah. And I was having a tough fight and like I was, I was getting, I was struggling to like, mm. I was struggling to find my rhythm because the guy clocked me a couple of good mm -hmm. times. And so I was like real timid. Yeah. Me, and I circled by and she was like, talk shit. Talk <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Bro. Yeah, that is gnarly. So I, I, man, and it started to turn the dog on yeah. in me, you know, and I was like, all right, here we go. Here we go. And yeah. like, cause in training camp, when she criticizes me, I get so fucking mad. You know, like, you're not even you know what I mean? Like we yeah. start getting into yeah. arguments where she's like, he's hitting you in the face the whole fucking yeah. time. You're not even moving your head. You know what I mean? I'm like, can you fucking shut the <laughs> fuck up? Like, You're not even paying attention. Yeah. I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to go for that. And she's just like, well, it looks like shit. Mm. You know what I mean? Or she used to like even get on coaches and be like, why is he stumbling? Like yeah. his footwork looks terrible. Yeah. Like, you guys doing footwork drills or what are you doing? And it was it was great for that's her. that's cool that she's your critic like that though because it might not be anybody else that can really get in your head like she does. It's important to have people like that. For yeah. Some, yeah, some people really need that type of person who's like, "Hey, you're being a fucking pussy yeah. right yeah. now. Stop yep. it." You know what I mean? Or like, and it stings a little bit. Like, oh shit, am I being a pussy? <laughs> yep. And, and yeah. it, it's it's good because like the thing is is that that's where that's where coaching comes into effect because you got to be able to like know when to get the rise out of somebody. You got to yeah. know when mm -hmm. somebody who's like when somebody's finding excuses, you know, or when mm. somebody's like uh, looking for a way out or when somebody's being a dog right now. And that's what gets you excited is when yeah. you see guys that turn into a dog, like you see them getting beat up against the wall and they got their hands up and you see them like come back with a hook, like yeah. ang with anger in mm -hmm. their, in their punches. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Ooh, I don't care that they got beat up. I, I want to train that mother. That yeah. Moment. Yeah. yeah. I like, I like that. That person can be coachable. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like that Mike Tyson effect of like, yeah, Tyson had that, you know, like they had to just get him under control and yeah. then they had to control what he was throwing. So it was like, if we can control <laughs> how he knows how to strike and mm -hmm. then we can tell him when to like be a dog and, and unleash it. Yeah. I think it was a custom auto quote. He said, uh, it's like a fire, right? Yeah. It's like, if you can just learn to harness the fire, the har the, the fire can burn your house down or it can heat your home. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And it's just learning to, to harness that, that, source yeah. i guess yeah yeah and, and tyson needed 
cuss in his life. Yeah. I, I think, yeah. I think was, was it cuss that did the, uh, what was it? The, what do you call it? It's not like meditation. Like, what's the other thing? Oh, like, he did hypnosis. Yeah, on hypnosis him. on yeah, Mike yeah. Tyson. Man, I just heard about that recently. I don't. I don't know exactly what that was about. I don't either. I just. I know I've heard it before, and that just that always sounded so bizarre to me. Like based off how amazing Mike Tyson turned out to be. Yeah, I heard stories that when Cus when Cus died and they went to clean out his house, he had books on like psychotherapy and hypnosis and all these wild books. And then when Mike when Mike Tyson was really young, he would tell him, "You're the greatest. You have to, nobody can fuck with you. You're the best. You're yeah. the fucking greatest in the yeah. world." He'd like turned into this like conqueror kind yeah. of mindset. It's like he just became Studied that, the that conquerors. dog. Yeah. yeah, it's almost like a split personality. In yeah, sense, yeah. You know I mean? because yeah. people have. I, I think that people have like like split personalities. Yeah, sense. I agree. Like, I'm I agree. not the same person when I'm stomping this motherfucker's head yeah. <laughs> than I am when I'm playing with my daughters. In yeah. The Park, that's you know? a good point. I yeah. have a different personality completely. Just the same like when you're angry. Mm-hmm. Like my wife and I are great about not making decisions when we're fighting or not yeah. like not like paying attention to the words that we said to each right. other when mm-hmm. we fight. Because oh, this is this is the angry you right now. Right. We'll talk later when yeah. we're not having this angry conversation. And um I think like that's what Cus was doing with with Tyson mm-hmm. really well. I think he saw saw a kid that needed some guidance, but you know, could be could be molded and and if he was able to be molded and controlled a little yeah. bit, he could be you know an absolute monster. And um, I think after Cus died is when Tyson went off the rails yeah. a little bit. Yeah, yeah. he, he kind of held it together for for a couple of years, but then um, yeah, everything else kind of started catching up in his life. And he was young. Yeah, man. he retired. Very young too. Mm. People, I think he was still like you know thirty two, thirty three when he was like did like his first retirement. And yeah. He was like, I can't do this anymore. I don't have the fight in me. Yeah, anymore. which could be the family affecting him also. Could yeah. be, you know. And he had a lot more things Sh- going demons, on yeah. for yeah. sure. But he was nineteen. Imagine was it nineteen when he became the heavyweight champion of the world? Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't remember. I think it was nineteen, 19 or twenty. Yeah, yeah. nineteen, 19 or twenty years old and being that fucking famous. Man, imagine that's younger than. What does that guys. do to your psyche? Like, does yeah. that to your fucking psyche? You're bro. like one of the baddest motherfuckers in the world. Women, money, man. fucking cars. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> what would you be like? What, what do you think you'd be like if you were the man at nineteen? I'd probably be an egotistical yeah. fucking <laughs> retard. To be honest. <laughs> well, that, well that, at what age did you get that first check? Like, at what age was that fight you were talking about earlier? Uh, I was twenty four when I got well, that even first then. Check. Like at twenty four, like are you even fully there? No, man, no. I made a bunch of super immature decisions. What'd you do? What, what was your What was your decision like when you got that big money? First thing I did was go buy two cars. Right, I didn't have. <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> what kind of cars you got? I got an Infinity G thirty five, and then uh-huh. I got a, a Jeep Patriot for my oh, wife. Oh, right, man, and, uh, paid off. Paid off. Paid yeah. them all cash. I, I got them fucking feel like, good though. I man. totally got fucked on on how much I paid for them, but yeah. at the time I was like, I'm a millionaire. Yep. I don't yeah. care. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When it, when a hundred grand was like, like a million bucks to me at the time. And like, we didn't have much, you know, like I was trying to make it as a fighter. I wasn't going to make it a lot that year. Yeah. But, you know, we, we had a one bedroom apartment and like a couch that my mom gave us. And like, uh, you know, we had a bunch mm. of $30 stuff that we had yep, found yep. on, on Craigslist and yep. stuff. And we were, we were, you know, we were going to make it. We were a young, hungry couple. We were, we were trying to figure out our, our way in life. And then, you know, the UFC fell yeah. into our lap. That's like the fighter's story, man. Like the coming from nothing and then instantly you have something. Like that has to be a, uh, like a, like a rude awakening in a way. Because like, were you, do you think you were prepared for it? No, no, no. I don't think so. Because yeah. like, like I was, I, I just got reckless with, yeah. with spending. You know what I mean? I think maybe now that I, I'm, you know, this was 10 years ago. Yeah. Like, like. I can I can look back on it and be like, what a dumbass. You know, I was like buying flights for everybody to yeah. go on vacation. You know, I was like, you know, just every weekend, you know, let's go to the bar or let's go. Let's I'll yeah. pay for everybody to bring the whole family, mm-hmm. you know, and it's like the lifestyle influx. Yeah. And and man, it was I'll be I'll be honest. I don't I don't necessarily regret any of it because I like, learned. Shit. Yeah, I learned a lot from it. Yeah. It was a great feeling, too. Like, I felt great mm. being able to do stuff like yeah. that. I felt great being able yeah. to, like, provide for people and make people happy and stuff. Those and are memories. You'll be able to keep them forever. 100 percent. You know, and and if I didn't make those decisions, it wouldn't make me who I am today yeah you know? and um you know any I think that age from 20 to 25 is like it's a tough age right because like you're looked at as an adult yeah. that's like on your own in this world already mm. right and you're you're looked at as like you're supposed to be making mature decisions already and yeah. you're supposed to be setting up for your future already but you're not like you're not like mature enough to yeah. to, to do that yet you still like 
that's that's kind of like my my wife has me thinking this too, right? She's kind of like that's like the bad thing about the American system is that they look at it like eighteen years old and you're on your own. Yeah. And she's like, no, 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 we're you're, you're a parent forever, right? And like, she's like, our daughters are gonna stay living with us until they get married, and like at least that's our plan, right? Really, and we want to keep them like, in, as as teach them how to be adults, teach them how to be young adults, teach them how to like be in their lives mm. like as much as we can and be in, in their lives and as involved as we can yeah. so that we can help them make good decisions. That's unique. I've never really heard that perspective from parents. Where's your wife from? She's from Mexico. And it's mm. different. Culturally, it's different there. Right, their, right. Their parents and their families are always invested. It's not like, yes. you know, you leave the nest and that's just it. Right. It's it, different. You married the family. You didn't yes. marry her. Yeah. You mm. know, and, and I loved that. About, I like that too. I loved it about her culture. And mm. I, yeah, I think maybe us <coughs> being foreign for each other was kind of like what attracted because she appreciated a lot of like small things that like nobody had appreciated that I had dated before and vice versa. I like, yeah. I, um, you know, she appreciated things that I, I appreciated things in her that I was like, wow, I yeah. never, never had that perspective before. Mm -hmm. And she had had, she was used to like, um, when I, when I asked her out on our date for the first time, I asked her if she wanted to go fishing. <laughs> and, like, and like, I didn't think it's probably like, that was the game back then. That was like, the, dude, I didn't know, on, what, I didn't know what else to do. Like she was kind of like, or something. Yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't do that, man. I was, I was going to get too excited and like, that wasn't going to go good. But she was like, you know, she was like immediately. She was like, "Oh my god!" Like that was yeah. she was get, she got interested because she was like, yeah. "People ask me out on dates and try to take me and impress me and shit." And yeah. she was like, "You know, you asked me to go fishing." It's different though. <laughs> yeah, it is different. Yeah, so it was uh, it was cool, but yeah, it's uh, I plan on I plan on being as involved as I can, mm -hmm. like for as long as I can. It, you know, they went back. There was a, I, maybe I'm I'm saying this incorrectly, but they were saying that there was a study that came out that said you know. Your brain doesn't finish fully developing until you're 25 years old. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, like, you're, and the last part to finish developing is your decision making part of your brain. Mm -hmm. So they wow. went, they went back and they started looking at kids who mm -hmm. committed crimes that were going to give them life yeah. in prison sentences, right? And they go back and they reevaluate because how you know you're, you're obviously not conscious enough to make a decision. So should we punish you as yeah. an adult for a decision you made as a child, right? Mm -hmm. And because your brain doesn't finish developing until yeah. you're much, much older, yeah. right? So they went back and started releasing people from, like, these life wow. sentence pr wow. prison sentences or, like, people that were involved in murders or, like, a robbery that somebody mm. else or they were guilty by association or something. And they started redoing it because, yeah. you know, you can't, you can't arrest a 14-year-old yeah. because his brain doesn't even finish developing for another yeah. 11 years. He's a child. Still. Yeah. And, um like when I think back about like now that I'm older, I, c I feel like mm. I can I can feel the effect of it. Like I feel that I feel like if I got if I got a hundred grand now, I probably wouldn't spend any of it for like yeah. six months or so. You know what I mean? Like I would fully pay off all my taxes and I would slowly be careful of like, yeah. is this necessary? Like let's make sure we save this for the future. Like is it how long is this money? I and mean, then what can we do with it in ten years? And if I yeah. put it here, how much money is it going to make? You know, I didn't think about any of that shit when I yeah. got a hundred grand when I was twenty four. I was just like, sweet, let's yeah. fucking go. You <laughs> know? You said you already like you were already in a relationship at that point, right? Yeah. Imagine you weren't, and then you were like doing that thing that everybody goes through. You make a little bit of money. You're going to clubs. You're trying to impress all these women. You're trying to impress these people around yep. you that might be fake people. Like at least you didn't even really have to go through that. It could have been a lot worse. I think that's why like a lot of athletes end up having multiple baby mamas and stuff, <laughs> right? Because you know you're not yeah. you're not finished like using your yeah. brain yet. You know, like you you get this money and it's like this seems like good in this moment but you know yeah. your decision making skills aren't aren't completely there yet and and yeah. i think that if i if i didn't have the family that might have been my scenario i might have like had you know been married and divorced mm. a few times just being yeah. like a fucking clown or yeah. retard or being distracted mm. but um you know it was it was good it was a good lesson yeah. <laughs> at least but now yeah. that i look back i'm like oh man Things could have been different. That makes me feel better, bro, because I'm 22 and I don't have shit figured out. <laughs> no, man. I'm lost. You're sometimes. not supposed yeah. to. You're not so society in in the world may th may look at you like you're supposed to, but you're not yeah. supposed to. You yeah, know? man. You're not you're not you're not an adult until you're like closer to 30. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like mid late 20s, and you're you're in my opinion more matured for an adult like situations. Yeah. yeah. Right now, you got to live your life as much yeah. as you can. Don't don't waste your 20s being an, uh, a parent. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, yeah. Like, I love my girls and stuff, but I wish I would have waited till I was, like, a little bit older to yeah. have my kids. Because, like, there's a lot of stuff you could do with with your youth still, yeah. you know? Yeah, I like the martial arts path, though. I just got into jujitsu like, almost two years ago. Yeah. And, I, like, I, like you said, there's a lot of left, there's a lot of lessons in it. 
Yes. I think there's a lot you could learn that you could like translate into your life from what you learn on the mats or from just sparring or from coaches that you have and shit like that. Yeah, for sure. It, 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 you you get, you learn a lot about people as a coach too. Like when you see people get in tough situations, if they're gonna fight out of yeah. it, if they're just gonna give up, you know. And sometimes it can be disappointing having yeah. too much intuition on because it's kind of like, oh man, I thought you had the dog in you. I thought you had yeah. that fighter in you. Like, you probably see that a lot, especially as a coach now. Like how many people get made or break make made or broken here? <laughs> man, you know, I we're still new, like in, yeah. in my side of the program, but. Uh, I've had like a few people already that were very interested in becoming fighters, and yeah. like, I've trained other people in the past that I thought that were that were good fighters. And um, yeah, man, it can it can it can, it kind of sucks sometimes. My wife says yeah. this to me too: like sometimes your intuition can like disappoint too much about get, can make you too disappointed in people, right? Yeah, because it's like you know you you expected them to be like, all right, here we go, here mm. we go, let me see the fight, let me see, and then they're like immediately they quit. Yeah. It's like, like, I don't know if I can even teach them a lesson here because they don't have it. Well, yeah. do you think that you could develop that dog or is it just in you? Man, that's a, that's a good question. You know, it can be maybe in the right circumstances in the right environment for long enough because that's how the dog gets developed in the beginning anyways. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, you gotta, it's your circumstances and your environment and stuff that's going to make that. And, and bring that out of you. Or yeah. It's something that you had seen or it's something that, that was around you, right? And Environmental, you know, right? Yeah, yeah, environmental. That's probably a better word for it. Um, but yeah, like, and that's why I'm like, I'm looking at guys that are like 24. Yeah. I got a lot of, I got like a lot of 23, 24 year olds mm. right now that I want to fight. And like, I start kind of like looking at that, like, how are they, how are they responding right now? Is this going to, How's this going to go? Yeah. And if they don't, if at this point right now, man, like I'm looking at guys that don't have the dog and I'm kind mm. of like not interested. Hmm. Like just, I'm just not interested. Maybe that ties into what you were talking about before though, about like developing mentally. Like maybe some of these 23, 24 year old kids come in here because they recognize that fighting is this glorified thing where there's so much glory, there's so much money, there's so much whatever involved, but they not, they might not really understand what comes with it when they sign themselves up for it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it takes obsession, you know, yeah. it takes, it takes like my wrestling coach had told yeah. me yeah, hundred percent of you mm-hmm. can't you gotta, be, can't be one fit in one fit out. Nope. Yeah. You got to go home and watch fucking YouTube till three o'clock in yeah. the morning. Yeah. You got to come to the gym the next day, trying out <coughs> things that you thought you saw yeah. on YouTube. Right. You got to be driven for this. You got to mm-hmm. ask me about this fighter and this fight. And it's like, I've, I've quizzed other guys before. Like, did you watch the fights or like, give me, give me like, uh, I've had, I had this, I've had kids that were like, I want to be a Muay Thai world champion. I was like, name, name three world champions for me. Ever. Like in, in any, like. In Muay, Thai. No, Muay Thai. Muay Thai. And they're kind of like, oh, uh, yeah. no, okay, name three current fighters for me right now. Mm. Right? And they're like, I was like, okay, name one. Name one Thai fighter. Yeah. Nothing. So they're right? not in that world. Not in that world. And they can say all they want to do, and they can hype me up, and they can try to get me excited as a coach of, like, I swear to God, you know, I want to do this. And I'm like, but you're not, you're not in this. You're not, you're not, yeah, you're yeah. not obsessed with this. you got to be obsessed with this. you got to mm. be, like, telling me, like, I saw Sanchai hit this sweet man, and I'm like, oh, what was it? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it was this one from this side, or yeah. I, saw, I saw a kick that Saxon did. How did he get that angle on the kick or something? You know what I mean? Like, yeah. It's almost like a coachable person in a sense, right? They got to mm. want it, and, like, if I want it more than they want it, then this ain't going to work. Yeah. yeah. Wow, well, that's Studying interesting, man. So do you think that you learn as a martial artist teaching martial arts? Definitely, man. Yeah. I think that's... Uh, once once I started coaching, you know, you start thinking about like finer details on stuff too, man. Like you start thinking about um, open doors and other ways and other pathways that you could do stuff and other yeah. reactions you could have. Like sometimes I'll start with something and like I had a plan when I was doing the class, right? Mm. Like I, I had it. I was thinking about this earlier with a private lesson that I was going to do. I was like, we should go jab overhand and then we'll go body lock. You know, I was like, you know what? This is actually right open right here. You know, so you start yeah. kind of like tying things in together, like. And you never you're never done learning as a martial artist. Yeah. It's either life lessons or it's techniques or you you're forever a student in this mm-hmm. world. Once you're once you start doing this, it's like you you appreciate stuff like that a little yeah. bit more, I feel. I feel like this is more of like a classic question, but do you have like your roadmap for your future and how long you want to do this figured out yet? Or do you just you kinda just are going with the flow? Man. I'm kind of going with the flow right now. You're 33, you said, right? I'm 33. So, so you're right around that age that they say is like the martial the arts peak. prime. Yeah. Like the 35. Yeah. And my, I feel like, uh, 
I've I've had a lot of injuries over my career. Yeah. I've had nine surgeries and damn. I need to I need to get another hip surgery done <sighs> soon because it's it's wearing on me. Yeah. But um Man, I don't know. I don't know how long this is going to go for. I don't know how long this is going to take me. I'll say this. I, I'm excited to see, like, when they come out with the statistic of, like, lower weight class guys, like, how, mm. long, how long their careers go for. Because they're probably averaging everything as a whole, right? That's a good point. I think I've they're more or less durable, the, the I lower think, weight guys. I think the lower guys are less durable, right? Really? And I think because they're getting – we have a much smaller – group of guys to pull from to train with yeah. that are going to be our size, right? Heavyweights got a lot of heavyweights. Light heavyweights got a lot of light heavyweights. Welterweights can train with a whole bunch of welterweights. Flyweights constantly are hunting for training partners, right? And they're yeah. constantly, like, that's a big <coughs> issue when I'm starting to look for somebody to do jiu-jitsu. I'm like, well, do you guys have smaller guys? And they're kind of like, mm, like yeah. a few, you know? And it's, that's, it's hard, you know? Yeah. It's, and those guys get beat on. Like, flyweights get beat on. The, the or I shouldn't say flyweights, the smaller guys get a little bit more beat on. And, yeah. and I heard Rogan say this a while ago, like, if you're going to do jiu-jitsu, uh, train with somebody smaller. Maybe it wasn't Rogan. It might have been somebody else. Because I think you're right. smaller guys have to learn the technique yep. more yes. appropriately yeah. because they can't apply strength like a big guy can, yeah. right? And so I was kind of like, ah, it's because small guys get smashed on in yeah. the gym a lot more. So I think their careers aren't going to last as long in the long run as a heavyweight would or a light heavyweight mm. and, because they're not – they're not getting smashed on as, as much as the smaller guys are. So. See, me from like an outsider perspective, I would imagine the bigger you are, the more damage and punishment you have to take. Because when you watch like flyweight guys fight in the UFC, like Brandon Moreno and David Figueroa, those guys went like four fights. And a lot of the time they're going really late into the rounds and they're just taking a whole lot of damage. But visually it doesn't really appear that they're taking a lot of damage versus like if you're watching like a Francis and Ganu fight, he hit somebody one time and you're, you feel that shit watching yeah. it through the TV. Well, size, size definitely yeah. makes a big <laughs> difference on, yeah. on the, the amount the, of concussion they can take, you know, um, you're right. Like even even the you know in Thailand they they if you watch the smaller guys and the younger fights the younger kids they they can go. Man. Yeah. They don't have the power to like put each other away mm. as much as like you know Francis does. Yeah. Francis come out one strike, you know, but a flyweight kind of comes out and throws the same strike might not mm. cause the same type of damage as it would for Francis. Um, so even then, like even then, I think that the flyweights probably beat the shit out of each I was other. Say the same yeah, thing. a lot. It's more. like volume though, because like yeah. now that I think about it, like speed and volume is probably more of like and a technique flyweight too. thing. These yeah. guys are super technical and they're just banging at yeah. each other. You you can't fall behind in one area neither, yeah. man. Like everybody in flyweight is good. You can get away with stuff at heavyweight, like Derek Lewis being like the a blue belt in jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. You, you can't, can't get away with that shit. Not in flyweight, bro. Yeah. Like everybody's mm -hmm. got to be good at jujitsu. You got to have wrestling. You got to have boxing. You got to have kickboxing. Yeah. You got to be light on your feet. You got to be able to mix them all up. And if you yep. can't, you're gonna get exposed. That's right? actually good that you. Say that. That's interesting you say that because now that I think about it, I don't really know any flyweight guys that are like specialists if in like that kind of way that like heavyweights or like light heavyweights or middleweights are. Yeah, they uh, they definitely are more well rounded, like yeah. as a whole, you know. And it, most of them are wrestlers. A lot of them came up in jujitsu stuff. Some of them are, are heavier boxers or heavier kickboxers. Yeah. But you definitely see a big difference in the heavier weight classes, mm. right? And like even even at heavier at the heavier the bigger the weight class, the shittier you can get away, or the be the more you can get away with shitty technique, right? Mm, like okay. Right, that's what I think too. Flyweight, you can't get away with yeah. with leaving a jab, yeah. a lazy jab out there. They're gonna hit you with a right hand like every time. In heavyweights, you might be able to get away with it a little bit more. In light yeah. heavyweight, yeah. you know, you can get away with not being a great wrestler. Mm -hmm. You know, it there's a there's a statistic that's fifty percent of heavyweight fights in in a knockout, right? <sighs> 50%. Oh. So we'll flip a coin whether this is, and this is the first round. Yeah. First really? round. Yeah. 50% yeah. of heavyweight fights into the first round. And now if it gets past the first round, it's going to be a decision most, yeah. most likely, right? Yeah. I don't know what the statistic is for flyweights, but it's definitely not a coin not flip. Not 50%, right? No. Not, not, not a coin flip. You right? don't see a lot of knockouts in the flyweight division really at all. No. No. There's not a lot because they don't have, they don't have the, yeah. the packing power like, like uh, heavyweights do, you know? And um, there's statistics for all of it, you know? Like, yeah. like I think it was like, 75% of submissions attempted in the third round don't work, right? And this is all from, from the coach I was saying earlier. Yeah. Ricky was just a brain, and um, he would go over stuff like this so that we would we would decide, are we going to go for mm. position or are we going to go for submission or are we just going to yeah. punch or are we going to stay here? Like, same thing, like, uh, how much time are we wasting on this takedown? Like, mm. how much time are we going to stay? Are we just – so it was kind of like, should we should we burn the clock here or should we move on to the mm. next move, right? It was, it was so um, – it was so 
so number it was such yeah. a numbers game. Yeah, it's complex, bro. Yeah, I it, didn't think about it that deeply. No. Yeah, it's there's each heavyweights <coughs> and flyweights should not be doing the same training sessions. Wow, it's yeah, a totally different fight. You know, wow. Heavyweights got to focus on striking. It's 50, yeah. There's a coin flip that they're yeah. gonna get knocked out in the first. Or knock a motherfucker out. Or knock the other guy. So what yeah. should we practice more? Probably okay. big pad hit, like a bunch of pads and stuff like that. Probably really sharpen up, yeah. you know, the striking. And yeah. I don't know what the percentage is for even takedown attempts, but I'm, I don't think it's real high. But if you look at flyweights, like, it's probably like an average of, like, three takedown attempts per guy per round. So yeah. you got you to wrestle. You got to – so the, their training sessions can't be the same. Mm. You yeah. Have, if, and that's kind of a mistake that some people will make. Hmm. Like, if you go into a room, an MMA room, and you yeah. guys are all doing the same shit, you got all the heavyweights, all the flyweights, and everybody doing the same stuff every day for years, mm-hmm. it's kind of not going to go great for some guys, right? Yeah. Because it's a different fight. It's, a diff- it's almost a different, whole different sport. And heavyweights are boxing, kickboxing, you know? There's even not a whole lot of kicks. It's mostly yeah. punching the shit out of each other. Yeah. You know? The heavyweight situation right now is extremely interesting, though, because you got your top two guys being Cyril Ghan and John Jones. Those guys aren't knockout experts. They're taking your ass uh, down. And John Jones you. might knock you Yeah, I mean, out. he probably could, but... <laughs> He's the, he's going to take you down and pummel you. He's an interesting heavyweight, though. Man, Jones Jones is the best. Like is that your goat in yeah. the UFC? Man, my yeah, my goat list is probably. I mean, I I can't throw it in any order, but it's like if I was going to put like top five goats on there, I got John Jones, George St. Pierre, mm. GSP, um, um, Matt uh, 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 Demetrius Johnson. I almost mm. said Matt Hughes, but I don't think Matt Hughes. So I got John Jones. Um, who else? Who else? Um, Jose Aldo. Mm. Savage. He just won a big fight, didn't he? Yeah. Right the the night. Uh, Masvidal yeah. thing, right? Yeah. The Masvidal uh, promotion? G, uh, uh, Jeremy Stevens. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, I, th- I like those guys, man. Let me see if I can think of anybody else. But those guys are going to be my, my, my top list, mm. man. Those are, those are my favorite dudes. Is there any like current guys like you're really fixated on or interested in or like applying some of their game to your game? That's a good question, man. Hmm. You know, I really liked um, uh, Yuri Prohashka. Yeah. That motherfucker's a savage. He's in the woods with katanas <laughs> and shit. <laughs> Dude, Fuck. He, but he throws shit that's like so... Yeah. Out, he, throws, he throws unorthodox, like sharp stuff, mm. right? Yeah, yeah. Like, like bouncing around a lot, too. He's a, like, he has a really wide stance. Yeah. yeah. So he'll shoot for a takedown. Flying knee. Yeah. You know what, yeah. Like, I, I saw him do that and get a knockout, and I was like, holy shit. And he, I don't know, he's he's somebody that I like. He did stuff like that that yeah. I really liked a lot. I like most of the Russian guys, too. Yeah. Um, they're, they're taking over. They're taking over. And for the most part, they're all doing the same systematic shit to everybody, yeah. you know. Um, yeah, that just the grapple heavy. Yeah. that, yeah. that And even, but most of, even most of their, their, ground systems, they're going like the same paths. Mm. They're doing the same. same How are you analyzing their ground systems? Like between like, uh, Khabib and Islam and Shavkat and I think Kamzat's from that same kind of realm. It's all it's all combat sambo, you know. They're, yeah, yeah. they're just taking their combat sambo and putting it in MMA, MMA yeah. right? And it's it's literally no different. If you watch combat sambo matches, it's almost the same stuff. And those Russian guys in that side of the world, when the UFC and when yeah. when they get the exposure that they're gonna get, they're gonna take over the UFC. So do you think that's the most effective way? Because I mean, look how dominant it is. Yeah. yeah. Probably, man. Like, like combat sambo. I think combat sambo mixed with like a little bit of John Jones striking is kind yeah. of like the way to go. And that's that. John Jones isn't like particularly like like if he went to a boxing match, I don't think he would do good in a boxing really? match. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. I, I don't. See. I don't think that he would do well in a Muay Thai fight either. Mm. But his MMA game, he's just such a computer and he's yeah. such a brain that he does tremendous. You know. Mm. I think f- out of Al- Albuquerque, John Jones trains in a very specific, customized martial art. And it has a name to it that his coach invented. I got to look this shit up real quick, so please bear with me. That's wild. Well, what did you think of, speaking of uh, Yuri Prohaska, I saw, obviously, you were with Jamal Hill earlier. That's yeah, yeah. fucking insane. Yeah, how was what, that? What do you think about that matchup, man, stylistically? That should be a fucking banger of a fight, yeah, man. I'm excited for that one. Jamal is huge, bro. Like, yeah. I didn't... I didn't think he was that big. I thought they were talking about him fighting a 185 recently. And I was like, who, Jamal Hill? Yeah, I don't think there's any way. Ooh. He looked like he was about 250 today. That, that dude was massive. Yeah. Um, man, he hits like a truck, too. Like, And and his flight with Glover, j- Glover just kind of like, you know, that stamped his position. I, I like his fight yeah. with, with Yuri. I think that's going to be a hell of a fight. I think that's like fight of the year yeah. type of stuff. Um, that's what I thought about the the Glover-Yuri Prosca fight. That had potential to be the fight of the year. Yeah. Um, and then you got uh, Alex Pereira coming up too. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be an interesting one. That was uh, 
I'd th- man, I'd still like to see him and Izzy go at it again. Yeah. I think one to one, they gotta they gotta kind of squash. Yeah. I thought he was starting to do well yeah. against him too. You know, it looked like he was starting to mm-hmm. land well against the fence, and then that's what I thought as well. But like from what the way I was hearing everybody else explaining it is like he was basically just absorbing the fire and just waiting to counter strike. Which I guess like when you're in that position and then it happens and you knock somebody out, it's very easy to say that I guess. But like from my perspective, watching UFC because I love watching UFC, but. It really looked to me like Izzy was taking a beating there for a couple seconds, and then yeah. out of nowhere, boom. Totally agree, dude. I totally agree. Looked like he was starting to get landed. Looked like like uh, Alex was starting to find his range, and then I think he just sat in the pocket. Just he just hung. He just yeah. you know weathered the storm and got him with the hook and put him away. By the way, this shit's called Gaido Jutsu. <laughs> Jutsu. Gaido Jutsu. Gaido Jutsu. Invented by some guy named Greg Jackson out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Okay, I know who Greg Jackson is. Uh, yeah. I don't. I don't. Never heard of that shit. <laughs> Gaido Jutsu. It sounds like some shit in uh, a fucking cartoon. anime, right? <laughs> Dude, yeah, no shit. That's a wild name. I don't know. Whatever he's doing, man, he's doing it right. Is working. Yeah. And I don't know if it's that shit or if it's everything else that it's going along with him and. John Jones is just a special talent. He know? is. It's, there's not going to be anybody like him. Uh, um, the story of John Jones is it's insane. I mean, it's still writing itself right now. But like for what he was able to do to Cyril Gone, like I mean, I, I was rooting for John Jones. I knew he was going to get it done somehow. But like I didn't expect it to be in that fashion. Cyril Gone's a bad motherfucker. Yeah, he just kind of walked through him. Yeah, and um, cool, calm, composed. Looked like he knew that he was about to win. Yeah. Looked like he wasn't surprised at all. Yeah. The result um, looked like he took his time, took it easy. He didn't even apply the submission with like severe mm. aggression. It was more no. like, I got you. Here it is. All right. That's yeah. it. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you for everything. Mm. Time to go home. Yeah. I don't even really know what's what's next for him. Going. I mean, Francis is no longer in the UFC, so there's not really like... Stipe, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's they're setting that up, but I don't think, like, that's not what everybody wants to see. Steve has been out for a while, too. Yeah, a long he? time. I believe, like, what, like, three, I mean, three years, right? Jesus Christ. I think. I didn't know it was I'm not much. sure, but I think Steve wants to fight, though. Yeah. I'm sure he wants the payday. Yeah. yeah. That's a big payday. <laughs> that's going to be a big one. Yep. Um What do you think about that? Like, do you think that that ties into what we were talking about earlier, like, one foot in, one foot out? Like, do you see, like, a lot of people, like, they're fighting just, like, make a living at a certain point, they don't, like, they kind of lose love for it? Yeah, yeah, for sure, man, for sure. Um, I don't know that those guys are going through that because those yeah. guys are very well paid. You yeah, know, they're they're, you know, even compared to the boxing, if they put that aside, because that's what a lot of people are disputing about is like the boxing pay versus the UFC pay. But if you put that aside, they're still doing well financially, and they have smart people around yeah. them that are telling them to make smart investments, mm, and agents and shit, right? Right, right, yeah. and so they're they're financially speaking, they're doing it, they're doing well. So I feel yeah. like they're 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 probably still doing it for the big paydays, mm. and I'm sure that that's that's a big inspiration. But it's got to be a lot of like a lot of like want. I yeah. want I want to be the best or I want to be the champ or because I feel like yeah. I thought I think Stipe is kind of like he's got to be you know teasing retirement for some reason okay, I, don't yeah, yeah, time. Yeah. I don't understand why he's not active I think he got knocked out by by DC in the last fight right Stipe? I'm not yeah. sure I thought that was maybe his last one was when he um didn't or I'm sorry, I thought his he, last was his last Francis, one to he Francis when he got was that when he got knocked out yeah, by yeah. So. yeah 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 okay so maybe that's why he's taking so much time off yeah, Maybe. I mean, that must be hard to recover from. Yeah. <laughs> what's that like? What's that like, bro? What's like, what's the, the glory and the, the maybe the shame after a win or a loss in a, an MMA bout? Man, it's it's tough, dude. Like, it, being a fighter and, yeah. and it's a lot of the highs and the lows. There's a lot of highs and lows. There's a lot of mental stuff behind it. There's a lot of depression. There's a lot of lonely yeah. times. Mm. There's a lot of disappointment. Um, there's a lot of rejection, you know, yeah. and, and all that stuff. Like, uh, it, it builds up in their in in an athlete's mind and emotions and uh, it's 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 you have to be around people that are also like understanding like what you're going through in mm, a sense, right. right you can't yeah. if if i just lost a fight i don't want to be around somebody who just got number one on sports center <laughs> you know i don't want yeah. i don't want to be around somebody who just had all this success and like i'm just i'm experiencing all this letdown and all this disappointment yeah. like other people can like hype you up and try to help you out and pick you up as much as they can and you can fake it but like you know how you feel and you know what it's like when you get in your car or when you're sitting yeah. there you don't like when i experience losses i go through like terrible spins sometimes and i uh uh I fucking lose my shit, bro. Yeah. And I've I've kind of like gotten better with it over the years, but sometimes yeah. it's 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 like up and down, it's high and low, but yeah. man, 
that's one thing that they'll probably talk about like in years to come is mm. like you know the emotions the highs and lows yeah there's there's a good documentary out called the way to gold that's on hbo max and okay it, I really connected well with that. And it was Michael Phelps and it's a bunch of mm. other Olympic athletes that okay. talk about um, life after the Olympics. Yeah. And, and depression is huge for those guys too, right? Because mm. they go through similar stuff that we go through, right? They, they're they expected to be super well-paid athletes. Yeah. They're, they're, you know, they're on TV. They're getting all this hype. They're getting all this attention and yeah. stuff. And then they still got to go check into their nine-to-five job. And like, yeah. they got all this like degrading stuff that's like going behind it in a sense, right? Because they're expected to be like superstars. Yeah. And, and um, it's a lot that goes into it, even dealing with the disappointment. Like there's a mm. girl who talks about in the documentary how when she fell in her ice skating ring and she says she heard the crowd and she heard the, oh, yeah. So if you've ever been sitting in the corner and you're getting your face, you know, they're, they're putting the inswell, they're trying to move the this eye so it doesn't close up. Yeah. And then you see, you look up and you hear that they're doing a replay and you just showed yourself getting fucking mm. drilled, right? And you hear the, oh, yeah. Right? It's a tough it's a tough like thing to like not hear. It's a tough yeah. thing to not listen to, you know, and to like be able to like take stuff like that and keep going. It's like, yeah, creates a fucking psychopath, you know, sometimes. Yeah. And um, I would have never guessed that that was the case. I can imagine that can make a hard motherfucker though, bro. Oh yeah, sure can, dude. What's life throwing at you at that at this point? You know, you ha- you know how to deal with that. What the fuck's life gonna give you that's gonna you know knock you down or yeah. break it, you apart? It will create a hard motherfucker. Probably not in that moment, and maybe not right yeah. away. Yeah, but it will create something that like, like at this point, nobody can fucking embarrass me in ever. Yeah, right. right? Nobody can. Nobody can fucking scare me. Mm-hmm. Never. Like it, I've created like this persona of like. I've I've had so much experience that s- for something to bother me it really takes a lot, yeah, right? Yeah. Like I my my tolerance level for bullshit is like through the roof now. Right? I can only imagine. I mean, to suffer like loss at in a combat sport at the, the on the top, world stage, yeah, on the world stage, yeah. and and it's like this: you signed a contract yeah. because you thought you were going to beat this guy. You told everybody you were yeah. going to beat this guy. You, yeah, you've believed in this. You trained for this, mm. and you you counted on the money. You counted on your win bonus money already. Yeah. you already making plans you already have all this stuff going behind this yeah. win that you're about to get and then you get a loss <laughs> all the money's cut in half all yeah. the disappointment all the cheers the after party all that shit yeah you don't want to go to none of it mm. you know you don't want to experience any of it it's a it's a roller coaster of emotions right and that's kind of something that like doesn't get acknowledged much in fighters and stuff especially if you get highlight reel and yeah. shit you know and um man coming back from that definitely uh creates like motivation it, and this is this is part of the thing that like it's, it makes me like excited to like mm. stay in the sport right because now like i can talk about stuff like this and i can like i could share stuff like yeah. this with other people and i can keep myself connected in the sport because like i'll never go work a nine to five i'll never yeah. i'll never dope, though. i'll never jump into other stuff mm. nobody's nobody's ever gonna hurt me like in a sense and like yeah. my daughters have seen me inspire them enough to where like they're going to be strong enough to like deal with stuff like this. Like yeah. me, my daughter, you know, she crashed on her back handspring the other day and, um, you know, they were surprised that she didn't cry. She's knocked out her teeth before, like yeah. hitting the beam before. And like, she didn't cry. And, and like her, her reasoning was because like, I've seen my dad yeah. get tons of injuries. I've seen him, you know, laid up for in the bed for a month because he had hip surgery. I've yeah. seen his face swollen Damn. shut before. And like, he keeps going and he keeps doing stuff. Yeah. So. That's uh that's how you can try to take that negative shit that's mm-hmm. happening and try to put positive energy. Oh yeah, bro. That's I'm all fucking about that beautiful, shit. man. I appreciate your honesty too in that regard because that's like I'm sure that's not super easy to talk about. No, definitely not, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'm probably filtering a little bit for you yeah. guys and now that, now that you know it's getting it's getting busy and stuff. Um but yeah, man, it's uh it's a weird it's a weird thing. It's a weird emotions, you know, like like um it's a lot of disappointment. And yeah. Rejection is one of the like, hardest things for human beings to, Fuck to yeah, deal bro. with, right? And you get all this rejection, and you get yeah. it all piled into at once, and you kind of have to, like, suck it up. And then you got to yeah. be the tough guy here. You got to nothing, you know, it doesn't bother me. And, like, I have other people looking yeah. at me, and, like, you got to you gotta push through it, and you got to keep going, right? And you got to figure out how to not let that shit stick around in your head. Yeah. Once you can kind of, like, figure out how to, like, take all that negativity, take all that disappointment, and be like, it's all right, we're going to use this. Yeah. Like, I know what 
what to do with this now, right? Mm -hmm. And other people have a harder time with it, and they can get they can get sucked into yeah. that, right? I remember in wrestling at state, first time I ever went to state, right? I was picked to to win first place. I put it in the newspapers in McKinney. We yeah. got a fucking undefeated guy going to the state tournament. I was like thirty five and and I won the first match and I lost the second match, right? Lost in double overtime, right? I lost like Damn. six to seven. I was yeah. like devastated because undefeated like, though, undefeated. And I lost my first match was like in the in the quarterfinals at the state tournament, yeah. right? I had smoked everybody the whole season, and I was like, I'm done. It was either first place or nothing. Damn. I don't want a third place medal. Yeah. I don't want a fifth place medal. I don't want none of this shit. I'm done. And I I wrestled that match. I wrestled the next match, and I gave the win away, and I went home. Right. That's your intro, though, bro. Man. For the rest of the, like your life. Yep, that was it, dude. And it was like, it was like coming back from that. The next season, I, I the next season I made it all the way to the finals, right? Yeah, I I I was a state runner up that year too. But like same thing, I lost in an overtime match. Like I, I lost by like a, yeah. and I came back and it came back and I came mm -hmm. back and I it it drove me to like continue going in the sport. And I didn't yeah. have like a team. None of the guys on my team, for the most part, were making it yeah. anywhere. Because, like I said, we had a brand new wrestling program. Right. And it, it you were was, the man on the squad. So you were right? going through all this shit by yourself. Yes, dude. And it's similar. It related. And, like, sometimes yeah. you see your path of, like, how God laying things out for you mm -hmm. and the way things were lined up for you. And, like, you can see, like, oh, that's why my childhood was like that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, bro. That's why this was lined up like that. It mm -hmm. created this who I am today. That's so funny you say that because I think about that very thing all shit the time. Shit starts to make sense, right? Like, that, maybe it's not, like... Like, me and him were just talking about, I think this the other day in Austin, we were like, do you think, like, you're dealt a specific hand of cards and it just plays out over time? Or do you think, like, shit just happens to you over time that, like, I mean, maybe, like, there is a lot of randomness to life or at the beginning you're just dealt a specific hand of cards, these problems and these uh, commodities, and then you just got to make with them what you can. Who knows, man? Yeah. Maybe we'll find out when we leave this world yeah. wh which way it was supposed to be. But, mm -hmm. you know, you try to make the best of whatever's coming. For me, like, I kind of think on both of them. I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, things are supposed to work out this way. and But mm -hmm. then you hit things that are like, why are things happening like this? Everything fucking right. sucks. Right? Yeah. So you got to be, uh, be able to be strong enough to figure out, like, you know, this happened for a reason. Yeah. This, you know, you your life is going like this for a reason. Mm. It'll make sense later. Yeah, yeah. Right? that's what I believe. I mean, I believe the universe tests you in that way. Like, it'll put you through some of the hardest experiences of your life. You might think, like, why me? Like, that's, like, what I think what they're trying to figure out is, like, are you going to be that motherfucker? That's, like, why me? Or are you going to, like, take with that what you will? And then... Just yeah. find some way to operate going forward. Some people can sit here, they can run into problems and sit here and talk about the problem, right? Yeah. We can sit here and talk about, fuck, man, this happened. Oh, my God, this happened. Yeah. This happened and this happened. And now this is going to happen. And now, yeah. and, and instead of just being like, oh, shit, this happened, what can we do? Mm. You know, figuring shit out. Yeah, let's figure this out now. All right, it happened. We don't need to see. We already know what happened. Let's not sit here and talk about it mm. forever. I already know what happened. Why are we still talking yeah. about it? We should be talking about the game plan of like how to resolve this already. Fuck yeah! yeah. And it's sometimes it's hard to figure that out. Though. You know what I mean? Like yeah, you guys, bro. You guys are young enough now to where like you guys can start putting and embedding ideas like that mm. in your head, right? But when you're young, you know sometimes you don't you don't know what to do. Yeah, you, know? you don't know how to like how to react, and like you c sometimes it can feel like you need somebody to help you, right? Yeah. Or like like you need somebody to help you with the answer instead of mm. like uh like all right. Let's start thinking of a different path here. Let's start yeah. thinking of a different route. How can we how can we get through this? You know? And mm. same thing like with jujitsu. It's exactly the same thing, right? You run into somebody who's like in side control or like they're about to get in side control. They're in your half guard. They're about to get mm. to side control. You're on the bottom half mm. and you're like, fuck. Like problem. <laughs> he's not there yet. <laughs> yeah. He's not he's almost there. This is a big problem. I'm in yeah. a terrible position. He's not there yet. Where can I go from here? It's like, oh, there's a butterfly hook. Mm -hmm. All right, now we're in you know, open guard now. Now he didn't get the points. And yeah. Same thing. And it's 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 crazy how martial arts can, like, relate to life experiences and yeah. stuff like that so well. It's yeah. high-level problem-solving with dire consequences. And there's stress involved, too. It's yeah. hard to solve problems when you're fucking thinking about all the consequences and all this stress is on top of you. Like, you still have to calculate amid mm. all that stress. Yeah. Yep. Uh, Custom Auto said something about that also. He said, when you get hit, you got to stay calm. That's the most important yeah. time yeah. to stay calm. Is like, And I took that as, like, both scenarios, right? Yeah. You got to be calm when you hit somebody yeah. also. Because mm. how many times do you see in the UFC, you, you see somebody get hit, mm -hmm. and then the guy just, like, fucking haymakers, throws as hard as 
yeah. you can to try to knock him out. You don't need that, man. He's already hurt. We mm. hurt him with like a regular punch. Let's just hit him straight down the middle. Yeah. Mm. He's, not, he's not looking. He's not. He's mm. lost right now. He's trying to see where the hell you went. Hit him trying straight. Trying to get it back together. <laughs> he's trying to get it back together. I've been yeah. there. I've been there. Like, I've been hit before and lost where the guy, I was like, oh, shit, where did he go? You know what I mean? Yeah. And he's still standing right here. But now he's trying to hit me so hard that I got my wits about me and we're good to go because yeah. he threw a bunch of bullshit at me. Yeah. But see, the way that I think that that translates to life is. Okay, bad situation, good good situation. Keep your composure. Yep. Like, don't get too too excited when shit's starting to go right. Yep. Stay calm. Stay at a seven. Hundred percent. Hundred. Like if but you when get, shit's going bad, same. stay calm, brother. Yep. When you get, get a, cool. When you get a hundred grand, when you're twenty four <laughs> years old, <laughs> <laughs> stay calm, brother. Stay, stay calm. Stay calm. <laughs> Act like you've been there before. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good Fuck, way to put man. it. What time we got here? I think we're, we're running low, man. Yeah. Well, hey, man. I mean, I guess on that note, man, this is a fucking really fun episode. I wish we had a lot more time. Sadly, it's our last day in Dallas, so we'll be able to enjoy the MMA practice tonight. I wanted to thank you for that too. This was uh, the other day when I, I uh, it, brother. Yeah, the other day when I did MMA here. That was my first MMA practice of my entire life. I mean, I did karate when I was younger for a little bit, but all right, yeah. sweet. So that was, I, I appreciate you doing what you did. Cause I mean, you didn't know who I was at that time. Probably you just walked up to me. You, you asked who I was, what I was doing there. It's my first time. I don't really know what I'm doing. Hop in. Like, I really appreciate that. Like, yeah, 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 of course. That's man, cool. Of course. I saw you sitting there. I try to look out for, for people all yeah. the time, you know, and, and, um, I try, I try to put myself in other people's shoes all the yeah. time. And th- what went through my head was I thought that like, I've been to a gym before and I've been intimidated to jump into a gym. And I was yeah. like, sometimes you want somebody to just be like, Hey, just jump in here, man. Yeah. I got you. And if it's the person who's running the class, like, yeah inviting you in it's a little bit more of like an inviting and yeah. i'll be like hey take care of him this is his first mm. day you know Hell yeah. yeah and i know not to like uh be crazy or whatever but like for what you were doing like you seem like you have a really good grasp on like being a coach i know it was only like one uh one mma practice but like what you were doing for everybody like it, it just seemed like you guys got a special little unit here i guess is what i'm trying to say so i mean o- this place octagon's a really dope place they've shown us so much love since we came here to dallas so far and i really appreciate that Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you for the podcast. Thank you for having me on. And yeah, man. I'm, Thank you, I'm man. Looking forward for when you guys return. Yeah. We'll be back. We'll definitely be back here. It was more. an honor. Thank you, man. <laughs> I really, really that. appreciate it. I appreciate it. you, Thank Ryan. you, guys. All right, Ryan Benoit, Octagon MMA. I appreciate you guys. Like and subscribe. And on Instagram, it's Babyface Benoit, right? Yes, sir. All right. Appreciate you guys. Love you guys. Peace. Let's go. <laughs>